Hello and welcome to the third and final part of our series on the Stonewall Dutch for Black against D4. It's uh, GM Max here again with another training and you may recall that in parts one and two we looked at the G3 systems and the C4 and Knight F3 systems respectively. And in this third part we're going to tie up some loose ends with going through Knight C3 the Stoughton Gambit, the London, and also the tricky Bishop to G5 system. I'm uh, not covering every single thing literally that Y can play, but definitely all of the important lines and such. Uh, I will add, by the way, that if you do want to avoid all of these systems, you can use the move order of playing E6 and then waiting for them to play C4 uh, or Knight F3 and then playing F5. And that will allow you to avoid the systems mentioned in this part. But this is only really going to be something that can be recommended if you are happy with the transposition of the French defense after e4. And I realize that not everyone here has the French defense in their black repertoire, so that's why we are covering the anti-Dutch lines in this third part. By the way, if you're enjoying the video in the series, do make sure to leave a like and also consider subscribing. Um, so let's start with our first game between Gelfand against Nakamura. I think this game is a somewhat old one from memory, but not like super old. But yeah, we see black play to move d5. Um, you know, it is also possible to play knight f6 and then play d5, but then you end up with these doubled pawns, which, while it's still perfectly fine for black, may not necessarily be everyone's cup of tea to you know play these more like so well, strategic positions with not the most flexible pawn structure. So by playing d5, we kind of avoid this problem to some extent where after bishop g5 we're not forced to play to move knight f6, but, you know, you could play, for example, a move like g6, bishop g7, and then knight f6, and then you're not going to get the, the doubled pawns on the uh, on the king side. Here's dog barking in the background. I'm not sure if, if you guys can hear it or not, but hopefully a noise suppression is really good on this mic. Anyway, the game sort of moved bishop f4 in the start of the Jababa London, and... We'll see that I recommend the move order of playing a6 here, because in the game after knight 6 the move knight b5 would have been a little bit annoying, kind of forcing our knight to a bit of an awkward square on a6, you know, if the only option is to move the knight back anyway to, you know, avoid bishop takes a6, then yeah, it's not really a an ideal situation, and you, know, you may recall that this sort of situation with the bishop being, you know, on f4, it's sort of the situation we saw in parts one and two briefly of what we generally want to avoid in when playing through the stone wall. It is true the C pawn is blocked, but yeah, the fact we lost some time with the knight and the pawn kind of offsets that fact. In the game though, after E3 and A6, we kind of get back to where we want to go. And sort of the difference here is that we're not just playing like a passive stone wall with the move C6 here. But we are in fact playing the move c5, and it is sort of active play in the center that kind of makes this playable for black, despite the, the white bishop being on the London square. Um, so white plays the move dc5, because otherwise, let's say if you castle, black is going to go c4, and get some quite good counterplay on the queen side with the pawns. Um, yeah, we are behind in development, but because the position is quite closed, we are able to get away with it and kind of catch up in development over, over time as such. So White plays dc5 to maintain the position of his bishop on d3. And after knight c6, I think that the move that Gelfand played here was very nice. You can see now this game was played in 2014, I believe in Zurich based on the date. Uh, but knight 2 is a very nice move, just preparing c4 and allowing White to have a pawn break in this position. Uh, you know, without such a pawn break, it would be hard to kind of suggest a good plan for White. Um, note, by the way, we can't really avoid it with b5 here because white can play a4 and sort of open up the position in his favor. So Nakamura just plays castles and lets white play c4. Um, and I quite like his next move here in the move of knight to b4 just to get rid of the bishop pair of white. And yeah, it is true that in the rising position, white is still a little bit better after knight c3, take, take. I mean, white does have the hold over the e5 outpost and pretty good peace coordination. So it's only fair that white has a little something here. But I think it's a position we can be reasonably happy with as black. We do have the imbalance of the bishop pair to kind of offset white's development in the hole on e5. 
I mean, position is like definitely not worse than any of the the positions that we saw in Stonewall parts. So that's for sure. Um, so after okay, c1, bishop to d7, knight e5. I mean, you could just play bishop e8 and just kind of play around the knight on e5 to some extent, but the move in the game of b5, you know, it can also be played, even if I think it's maybe not the most precise. After rook fc8, white did trade off the bishop pair, and yeah, I mean, I think white is just sort of slightly but quite comfortably better in this position, where, you know, a4 kind of shows that our pawn is a little bit weak, and, you know, Nakamura won the game, because, yeah, it's Nakamura, he can, you know, win from almost any kind of position, you could say. But, yeah, from terms of the opening or middle game, it is true that white played this game very well to this point, and, you know, we got rewarded for it. By having a, a pretty nice advantage, like you can also try and attack our, our e6 pawn. So that's why I kind of suggested this bishop gate is sort of an improvement, which I think would give black a, a very adequate position in, in this case. Uh, but those are the main things I saw I want to share with this Gelfand Nakamura game. Now let's move on to a game between Elyanov against uh, Purin. And this is a game where you know, Elyanov outrates Purin by 100 points, but still, you know, the Polish gem playing black did manage to win this game, and you know, that speaks to the the dynamic potential of the Dutch just in general. Um, so the first moves were pretty much the same, but yeah, we see here that Elianov didn't play the move DC5 that we saw in the previous game, but rather played the move Castles, which, as I mentioned before, does give us the opportunity to play for C4 and B5, but you know, Purin did not avail this opportunity. I have a feeling this is probably a Blitz game, because I think in a slower time throughout the game, you know, a two sound plus jam would just play c4, I think, every single time. But yeah, after knight c6, it sort of gives Y a second chance to play dc5. But yeah, knight e5 was played instead. And it's a reasonable move to occupy the outpost, of course. And you know, it is true that you know, we're not threatening just to win the pawn because they can play take and an ed4. And I'm guessing that White Black rejected this because he was concerned about the backward e6 pawn being a problem. But I think that with c5, black does get reasonable counterplay in the sense to offset that. And yeah, after like cd4, bishop d6 castles, I think that our very strong central majority kind of absolves us of any major problems. So it's probably the way I'd play it. But, you know, bishop d6 was played in the game. We had takes, takes. And I think this sequence here is a good example of what white's aiming for in these positions, where he's able to resolve the problem of, you know, this... Uh, knight on c3 blocking the structure and in general once white gets in c4 he's normally doing very well in these positions yeah it maybe un helps to undouble the black pawns a bit but they were getting undoubled anyway and you know, we do need to kind of open things up so once again this game probably isn't the absolute perfect model from black's point of view because white is i think somewhat better here uh you know just with his hold over over the dark squares but black's move at e5 at least does something to try to disrupt that a bit and I think after takes and takes after knight e5. Yeah, probably f4 is where white maybe lost his advantage. You know, I think at this point black was was basically doing fine. Once again, it's in bishop e6. You know, if cd5, we are getting our bishop active. And you know, bishop is more active than the white knight here. Which does make up for our pawns being a bit isolated. Um, but in the game, yeah, white end up playing c5. And you know, black was sort of able just to yeah get some chances. Um d4 maybe is a little bit too early here you know i think we could maybe a little bit more patient and you know, play like rook e8 and just build up the position a little bit first um actually the idea of bringing the bishop to a6 would be a a very interesting way to free this this piece in fact in the long term but d4 was played rook fe1 rook a8 rook e5 and again once this bishop gets super active black is going to be very happy here and the move knight b6 is probably in hindsight a mistake. I think white probably has to go rook d1 and just try to get rid of this pawn as soon as possible, basically, to be okay. Once that pawn kind of sticking around for a while, it's going to be, be quite difficult for white. Um, from here, I feel like the game maybe loses a little bit of its relevance. I think that rather than move queen a3, which felt like a bit of an empty shot in the game, I think that if black plays either bishop e4 and, you know, just trades into this end game where the pass pawn will give black an edge, or even just plays bishop c6 just to not give the c4 square to white's pieces. Yeah, I think in this case, black's going to be considerably better. You know, white's pawns are quite split up as well, which doesn't really help his case here. So from here is why I feel the game maybe loses a bit of its relevance, but definitely a kind of interesting middle game showing that 
even a position which is not fully equal, you know, when Black misplayed a little bit with uh, not playing the move C4, um, yeah, it still it gives you chances even if you don't play it perfectly. Uh, kind of a bit like the King's Indian in some respects. Um, but yeah, for the next game, uh, just realize I actually accidentally include this game twice. Yeah, it's fine. It's like the game was so good that we already like included two times in the study. But yeah, this was a more old school game between uh, Sakev as white against Volokitin as black. And yeah, in this game, instead of playing the normal bishop d3 and just developing normally, uh, like we saw before, white goes for the move knight e5. So I'm trying to play it a little bit more dynamically. Um, you could play the move c5 as, as we saw before. But I think that Volokitsyn was a bit nervous about g4 and you know, why getting quite a strong attack on the king side this way. So this is why he plays move knight bd7 as a kind of prophylaxis against g4. Uh, but it's sort of funny in that sense that why I played the move g4 anyway, still sacrificing the pawn. But it is true, white does get compensation for it after h3, knight h6 and you know, take take. Our king is forced to the d7 square, which is of course not absolutely ideal. Um, yeah, maybe the extra pawn doesn't mean so much when it's doubled, but we do have the bishop pair. And if we are able to consolidate our position, I think black can be pretty happy. Uh, the game went castles. And yeah, the move like c6 and king c7 is kind of the first thing that would come to my mind here is black. But I also like the move of queen g5 that Volokitin played, just you know, offering the trade of queens as a typical way to defend. And you know, it's sort of interesting in itself that maybe white's best pair is actually to let the trade of queens happen. Saying that, you know, White still has decent positional compensation with his, you know, lead in development and sort of grip on the center. Instead, White played Queen F3, which I think is probably more natural from a human point of view to keep the Queens on when the, you know, when Black's King is on D7. But this Stonewall structure is so solid that it's hard to really get at the King. And you know, in the meantime, Black was able to consolidate his position, you know, Bishop to D7, just continuing to develop, Knight D4. Um, yeah, some of these moves could argue maybe they could be a bit more precise, like, for example, the engine really likes a prophylactic b5, just stopping white getting in c4 for a long time. Um, it is true, probably it's even better on the, on the previous move, but yeah, the move queen f7, of course, is still fine, and, you know, black just traded off some of the white attackers. Getting a position like this, you know, after king b1, um, yeah, I mean, rook c8 would seem most natural to me to, you know, meet rook c1 with king b8 and, you know, not block in the rook, but, well, after queen g5, yeah, we had queen h2, rook c8, and, and yeah, this arising position is just, let's say, a little bit better for black. Um, king b6 is a little bit creative, but yeah, it does get to the, to a7. I think probably what, what white was, what black was nervous about is maybe you didn't want to allow something like bishop takes f5 and you know these sort of tricks and be one way that white can try to turn the tables on black so playing king b6 and going that way just avoids that problem um yeah i'm not going to go through the full game because yeah it's true there's a, a lot more moves that were played but we can sort of see from here like the black is basically safe and has managed to consolidate the extra pawn it can now start to make use of his bishop pair and in the end volokit yeah, did go on to win a very nice game uh, later he also flicked in bishop e8 just to kind of tie white to the weakness of h5 as well. Um, so a very, very nice example. And you know, definitely this was the game that kind of inspired me originally to look into the a6 movers black uh, back in my late teen, early adult years when I was first looking at the Dutch from black's point of view. As for this next game, this was played by... Actually, this we kind of move on from knight c3. Like we kind of looked at, at these moves already. Uh, with bishop f4 a6 with this game between shen against kamsky kamsky being one of the top old school experts of the the dutch defense well basically the staunton game that's kind of next on the the list of systems and well we take the pawn knight c3 and you know we have to be a little bit careful of when we play d5 we don't want to play it immediately because the queen h5 fork is a really big problem in that case knight f6 avoids that and well, this reasoning also explains why white plays bishop g5. Again, to try to avoid d5 consolidating the extra pawn. Um, I think we'll see in a later game, yeah, what happens if, you know, if we do play out this sort of position. But yeah, with bishop g5, actually the best move for black here, according to modern ninjas, is one that is quite different from the lines that I was looking at when I first was learning the Dutch. But it 
turns out that g6 is actually a, probably the best move for black. And the idea is not just that you're preparing a fiend cattle of the bishop, but you're also preparing a move like d5 as well, without running into, you know, bishop f6 and, and queen h5. You know, if the pawn's already on g6, this just doesn't become a factor. So g6 is kind of a nice move to remember, and you know, I think you can really figure out most of the the details from there in a game, but we're still, of course, going to, you know, look at a few games and see how it plays out. You know, if they do play F3, once again, we go D5 and, you know, just keep our extra pawn alive in, you know, in this sort of way, Knight E4, and now King might look a little bit sort of open at the moment, but, you know, we are going to be able to develop, and, you know, we also have the option of Castling Long, which is a, a nice alternative to short castles. And if they do play Bishop F6, yeah, it's something that, you're probably going to see a lot more online over the board, but yeah, just pointing out that this is a very comfortable position for black here. Um, you know, even queen e7, and yeah, I mean, this is just... This actually already is kind of bad for white. Like, they already have to go queen e2 and play into this sort of bad ending where black just has the bishop pair advantage. Because if bishop e2, you already have queen b4 as a, a nice little fork to pick up a pawn for free. So that sort of indicates some of the problems that white faces if they just take back the pawn at any price. Uh, in the game, white played the move of d5, to which black played bishop g7, and yeah, you know, the idea of d5 is just to try to avoid d5 by black at all costs, but it does pay, have a price it pays as well, like, you know, if you castle, then, well, the bishop isn't covering this anymore, and, you know, d6 is a little bit of a of a dead end, you could say, around this point, like, this is certainly helping black. So, in the game, white played, we play, black played c6 instead, which I'm it's certainly a playable move to go after the center in this way, but it probably wouldn't be my top choice. Um, you know, White can play knight e2 and, you know, just try to make use of his lead in development in the long term with, I think, quite decent compensation. But instead, queen d2 was played, and yeah, that kind of allowed Black to realize his plan. Um, you know, it could even have just taken the bishop, which is probably the move that I would have played as Black, just knight c6 and you know, just prepare like h6 and e6 and just kick away their pieces over time. Um, or even just d6 for that matter. But in the game, black played queen a5. Definitely a playable move as well, but again, probably wouldn't be my top choice. So at castles, d6. And here, white decide just to regain the pawn with take, take 94. But a bit like we saw in the other line, black's actually quite happy when white regains the pawn. Because now the queens have been traded, which neutralized white's lead in development. The move bishop f4 does threaten to win the exchange, which is why knight e2 is played. Bishop f5, knight g5, bishop f6, very direct play. Knight e6, king d7, and... And I mean, at this point, I think if, you know, black was playing its player's same rating, maybe you'd just go king d7 and accept a draw by, by repetition. But, of course, with camp scout rating is playing by 300 points, he keeps the game going. And yeah, quite instructed to see how he sort of outplays his opponent in the arising, like, opposite color bishop endgame. So um, for this, I'll just show you the moves. I'm not going to do too deep an analysis, but just again, get a feel of, like, realizing that these uh, these opposite color bishop endings are nowhere near as drawish as, as people think they are, especially when you've got the rooks or the knights, or in this case, both still on the board. So h3, e6. And yeah, we can sort of see white flag now fixing some of the white pawns as weaknesses. You know, black structure is definitely a lot more flexible here. A6, B5, just, you know, grabbing space on both flanks. A4, A4 is a decent move here, actually, to try and improve your defense chance by trading some pawns. Still, black is better here, and yeah, now the move D4 was really well-timed. Just, again, kind of opening things up and bringing the attack against the white king. White well, didn't really defend this in the best way. You know, he played bishop D4, knight D4, king B1, knight F5, and... You know, the move bishop c2 does end up being a bit of a blunder here. Though in fairness, I think that the threat of knight e3 already makes it very hard for white to save the game. But bishop c2 ran into the move of rook take c2. To which white resigned because, you know, allowing black to take herring on the second rank is no good. But if king c2, knight e3, and yeah, you just win a piece basically. So very nice game by Kamsky. And yeah, that one I, I did want to share in, in full for you all. So let's now see another game in this uh, in this Staunton Gambit. This one was between Matuski against uh, Sandikan. And in this game, yeah, we see 
the same first four moves, bishop g5, g6. Um, one move I didn't mention before is the move of h4, which is definitely quite thematic, you know, to go h5 and try to rip open the, the black king as such. However, I think it's probably not as scary as it looks, where I do consider the move bishop h5 to be a pretty solid response. Just intending to take back on g6 with the bishop. Um, yeah, you know, they can play take, take, and g4, you know, they can get their pawn back as such. But it's nothing too much to perturb us. I mean, black does have the the bishop pair. They've got a strong center. We are threatening the pawn on g4 to some extent. And yeah, they probably have to play a move like g5 to already avoid being much worse. But it's fine. We can just take it, you know, queen h5. And, and we sort of see why it just doesn't really have anything in, in this position, like queen g5, c6. Black is going to develop normally knight d7, bishop e7, long castles to complete his development. And yeah, black just has absolutely no problems in uh, in this situation. It has been shown in a, in a good mix of over the board and, uh, and high level correspondence play. Uh, that's why like the one line is kind of good to know beforehand. Like if you're going to remember something, the rest is sort of pretty like standard. But yeah, bishop c4 was white's attempt to, you know, try and make it harder for white to, for black to get the king castled. Um, in this case, actually, I don't mind the move of c6. Like, you definitely played in a very similar way to how uh, how Kamsky did in this version. Because, you know, d5, bishop, g7 would actually transpose back to that game that we just saw. But, yeah, bishop, g7, of course, is okay as well. Knight, e2. Um, knight, c6, a little bit creative, but definitely also possible. Uh, after a3, a3 might look like weird, but the to kind of keep the bishop on this long diagonal here. Uh, but now black goes d5, and yeah, there's sort of a very common idea in the Staunton to look for the right moment to give the pawn back to neutralize the white initiative, and you know, with f5, we can see black has a very nice amount of space in the center, and you know, once we manage to get our king castled, we're not really going to have any problems whatsoever. You know, I mean, we can always just castle long in, in such a case. And yeah, in the game, white tried to be quite direct with his play, but it was somehow not so effective, where it turns out you're not even so concerned about them depriving you of the right to castle because your piece is so active that your king is actually reasonably safe in the center you know it being fairly closed for the moment after bishop c4 take take um yeah maybe this is where i feel the game maybe loses some of its relevance where i think if black just goes a5 and plays bishop a6 to develop the bishop actively or even plays move like bishop b7 just to avoid knight d5 and kind of make a move like bishop h6 or g5 stronger yeah, I think that this would just give Black a big advantage. Black still went on to win the game anyway after a long struggle with the movie played at G5, um, which does sort of allow an unnecessary knight D5, but I mean, with the bishop pair and strong center, Black's going to be better in any case. So in the end, he did go on to win a nice game. And well, let's see. I believe this one's the last game with um, that we have with the Storm Gambit, if I remember correctly. And this one features something you might face a little bit more often at the club level, which is uh, the move of F3. Uh, instead of the, the move bishop g5. And as I mentioned before, yeah, you don't really want to play ef3 in these positions if you can help it, because white just gets a really big lead in development, and it's all like a black mardima, but where the weakening of not having an f-pawn really costs you quite dearly. So by playing d5 instead, we just avoid that problem, where we're not really concerned with them doubling our pawns, because, well, for one thing, it is an extra pawn that we have here, um, if they play bishop c4, yeah, knight c6 is kind of a nice way to attack his pawn and, you know, sort of disrupt the the bishop on this diagonal so that, you know, we can ultimately castle our king to safety. Uh, but the game saw bishop g5, which is the main line. Bishop f5 was played, bishop c4. Um, black played move e6, which is actually a little bit of a mistake. Um, I've got to introduce the players. This was a correspondence game between Ericsson against Astrom, so... Yeah, you want to be a bit careful about, you know, opening the pin on the knight. And as I mentioned before, I'd probably go for knight c6 here, uh, where if they play like d5, you can go knight a5 and you know, sort of disrupt their setup for long enough that black's going to be okay. Uh, bishop b5 is nothing, just c6 covers it. And if queen d4, yeah, we can just play like... Actually, you can play pretty much anything in this position and more or less be fine, but... Yeah, I kind of like the approach of going for g6 and bishop g7 and just getting our, our king to safety in, in this sort of way. Um, it's a sharp position, but one where I don't see black ever being worse. 
Uh, but in the game, Black played E6, and the problem with this natural-looking move is that now G4 is quite strong, actually, where you can't play to move Bishop G4 because there's Bishop takes F6, and you know whichever way you cut it, White is going to be, you know, winning a piece in this case. Um, so this is what Black had overlooked in this old correspondence game, and yeah, after Bishop G6, I think that. Well, why play bishop e6, but actually knight e2 and going for it this way might actually be even stronger. But bishop e6 was played in the game, and yeah, it's probably somewhat lucky for black that, you know, his position isn't sort of worse in a way, but, or isn't even worse. But yeah, it is true that white did have a pretty big advantage around this point in the game, and that, yeah, black only won because of some big mistakes by white later on. So kind of lesson for this game is, yeah, just make sure not to play e6 and, you know, prioritize knight c6 instead. And that's going to give you a, a very fine position. So with that being said, um, yeah, there is also one other idea I want to show before I move on to the, the Bishop G5 systems, actually. So it turns out that with this Bishop F4 move order, like the accelerated London we see in this game between Perez Ponce against Bassem Amin, um, if white plays knight F3, it's just going to transpose back into part two where we looked at via the two knight f3 move order. And that's what most of your opponents going to play. But in this game, I decided to go for a bit of an unusual setup with the move h3 uh, instead. White could also use the bishop e2 move order, with the point being that a move like c b6 is not so appealing when they can go like bishop f3 and sort of beat us to the diagonal. So in that case, I would probably just go bishop e7 and you know, at some point they're going to have to play to move h3, you know, or they have to play move knight f3 for their sub to make sense. Like, if they play, you know, h3, that gives us options like knight e4 and, you know, putting a knight here and going for bishop b4. Uh, or if, let's say, they play knight c3. Funny enough, even with a loss of tempo, a move like bishop b4 is actually not that bad. We can just head towards the kind of territory we saw in part two with the c4, knight c3 systems where we'll just recycle the bishop, play like d6, and yeah, just go for kind of the standard setup that we've seen in, in the earlier parts. So with that being said, white played h3, black did play to move b6 anyway, um, because yeah, it is true in this case, we are making it to the diagonal in time. And probably white should just play knight f3, I think this is the correct approach here, and try, suppose back to what we were seeing before, but in the game, white played bishop f3, and... It does leave an interesting question of how we should best deal with the attack on the bishop. And the way that I've been mean, dealt with it was to move knight e4, but I think that if you want to play a move like d5 instead and, you know, just say that their bishop looks really weird and blocks knight coming to e5, I think that this sort of approach here would definitely be, you know, 100% fine for black as well in this case. Um, leads to a bit more of a creative position, whereas... Yeah, knight e4, I guess, is maybe a little more thematic for the Dutch, but maybe not quite as precise. Because, yeah, white could go, like, knight e2 and, you know, castle and, you know, sort of make the point they'll have some pressure on e4, but admittedly it's nothing too major. In the game, white played knight d2, and, again, I kind of like the move d5, just kind of saying that, you know, white really wishes the bishop wasn't on f3 anymore, but... Yeah, bishop e7 was played in the game, and I do think that here white could have played like takes and queen h5 and kind of asked some difficult questions, because I do think that the weakened position of the, the black structure and the black king can be a bit of a problem here, um, which is kind of why I suggested the move d5 a move earlier. But in the game, white sort of took the other way, which was just nowhere near as effective, where in this position black was basically just doing quite well here. Castles, queen d2, and... Yeah, Bishop E6 is quite a creative move where, you know, it's probably objectively not that great because the sort of weird formation of pawns is maybe lacking some necessary flexibility. But, I mean, if you want to play something like C5 and, you know, pressure the center that way, or if you want to, let's say, you know, play a move like Bishop G5 earlier and, you know, trade off the bishop, I think that, you know, this pressure against F2 would give Black a pretty good position. But, yeah, I do feel the game maybe loses its relevance a little bit from, from this point. So with that being said, we can now go to sort of, well, it's actually going to be kind of the second last part of this training, but the last part for d4, f5 at least, with what to do if white plays to move bishop to g5 in this position. Um, and bishop g5 is a little bit of a tricky line, actually, because 
much like we saw in the Knight C3 line, like this sort of structure is one that we would definitely prefer to avoid. Like having these double pawns is just not really very healthy for us, especially when we haven't even managed to get in the move D5 already. And if we play a move like H6 and just chase the bishop, then I can play moves like e4 or e3 and, you know, the weakness of the king can be a little bit of an issue in the long term. So that's why the most reliable system for black nowadays is, is considered to be just to play g6 and head the play towards a Leningrad Dutch type of setup with our bishop g7. Um, if you really want to avoid the move e4 that was playing this game between Pardo Simon against Gadakamski, you can play the move d5, but it's also true, yeah, that bishop g7 is is probably just a better move here. Because it turns out that e4 is actually not all that scary. We have to take, take, and d5. We are getting some quite decent play in the center. Uh, if they play knight c5, you can sort of kick away their knight with like b6. And, you know, wherever that knight goes, it's going to be a little bit awkward. Like the knight is a little bit dominated on b3 by our pawn. And yeah, we do have a bit of a hole on e5, but I think our active piece play is is going to make up for it here. In any case, I played the move knight c3 in the game. And yeah, black plays a quite creative move, which I do like quite a lot in this move of knight to h6. By bringing the knight to f7, we're going to attack their bishop. We're going to prepare the e5 break. And we also kind of keep open the long diagonal for our bishop, which wouldn't be the case after the more automatic knight to f6. Um, so yeah, I really like this up. Kamsky played like knight c6, just focusing everything towards the e5 square. Queen d2, bishop f5. Um, if you want to play bishop g4 instead, that's also fine, by the way. Uh, that'll probably be more connected with long castling, but in the game, black also castled long, where I think white should probably play a move like bishop b5 just to maybe try and, try and dissuade long castling from black. But he went in for the more passive bishop e2, and I think that you know, this position is just completely fine for black. It's maybe a bit hard to get an e5 in a good version because there is some pressure on the d5 pawn in that case. But black doesn't even really need the move e5 here either because his piece is just a, a very free-flowing as such. It turns out technically you actually can play e5 at this point because if they do play knight takes d5, you, you actually do get pretty good compensation here with uh, the move bishop e4 and you know, putting some pressure on the long diagonal as such. Um, but it's not necessary to play it either. You know, King B8 is in the game. It's also fully adequate. And yeah, A3, A6. We see both players making some small improvements to their position. With you know, both sides grabbing a little bit of space over on the king side. Um, yeah, Bishop E6 is kind of interesting, but sort of realizing that, you know, at some point we want to like keep pressure on the this pawn here so that they don't have an easy break of H4 to attack our, our structure. Um, and yeah, the rest of the game, I mean, it was a sort of a, a fairly maneuvering battle until white suddenly started to go astray. Like, not h is probably already a step in the wrong direction, but it does feel like the position is already a bit more comfortable for black with white, yeah, not maybe playing in the absolute best way. So knight d2, h2, knight d6, f3 is trying to cover this square, but it does again leave the knight out of play, which is why probably not a big fan of this move. And bishop g8 is a really great move here, just clearing the way for the e5 push, which is more effective now that the, the pawn here is defended. Uh, like, say, for example, if white plays knight f1, like, just to sort of show you what happens if white does try to take the pawn on d5, well, he gets killed very quickly with knight e c4 and, you know, just a, a fork galore at this point. So white plays knight b5, trying to reduce the damage. But still, the arising position is just so nice for black. You know, the knight's under attack. E5 just breaks through, and yeah. I'll show the final moves, only a, a few more of them. C3 covers the mate threat, but now D4 is coming. And after takes, and now the move queen to D5. Very nice final move by Kamsky. White actually resigned here, because there's no real defense to queen A2. Uh, like, if you play B4, you're just completely opening up your own king. Black's going to regain the pawn with knight D4, and then the... Bishop, Rook, and Knight all into the attack, and yeah, just a very nice example of like how to outplay a lower-rated player in the in the Dutch defense. Like White didn't sort of make any real tactical errors, but just kind of got outplayed strategically in a bit of an unusual structure for well compared to other openings. Uh, but let's see the next game as well between Komarov against Gleck, which also features this uh, this same starting moves of Knight C3 and E4. 
But yeah, this time White goes knight c5 instead of knight to c3 that we saw in the previous game. Um, by the way, I will point out if they do play knight g3 that, yeah, the move c5 is a good reply. But we're going to get some quite nice pressure against the, the white center in this case. But yeah, the game saw knight c5, b6. And this time, rather than the move knight b3 that I mentioned last time, white actually plays the move knight d3. A little bit unusual, sacrificing a pawn to try to get some lead-in development and attack going. I will say, though, I don't think this sub particularly impresses me here. I mean, if white plays a move like bishop e2 and, or c4, I think white does get good compensation, but it's only really compensation to fight for quality rather than compensation to fight for an advantage. So white goes knight d5 instead, but this is probably not the most precise because queen d6 just already targets this knight here. Um, note, by the way, after bishop f4... And in the game, black played knight c6. Though I will mention that, you know, a move like queen b4 in this fork might actually be a bit more precise here. You know, just steering the play towards an end game as such, where our extra pawn be more valuable. That being said, knight c6 does set up a nice little trick where, you know, if they do play bishop b5, which is maybe the first move that'd come to mind to the average player, then, yeah, queen b4 does just win the bishop. It's something you might catch out a few players with online, but... In the game, I played a bit more sensibly, playing knight c6 and queen to c6. And yeah, giving up the bishop for the knight maybe isn't so ideal. But we are up a pawn, and you know, it turned out in the game that it was not so easy for white to kind of make use of the, the weaknesses around black's king. And black just followed a very practical approach, just playing the move e5 and just sort of blocking the diagonal that way. Of course, white can't take the, the pawn on e5 because we all take and then win the queen with rook e8 as such. So white castles long instead. Uh, black played d4, and yeah, maybe this is where the game loses some relevance to me, because I think d4 was a little bit of a positional mistake. Um, it's not terrible, but I mean, you are kind of giving white a lot of squares and making your center not so strong. So I think if I was black here, I probably would just play queen f6 and just go for this setup, where the bishop pair does give white some compensation, and you know, they definitely have ideas like h4, to try to create some practical chances. But overall, I do think that, you know, black should be better as long as he keeps things reasonably closed. Uh, but yeah, that was my one share of the Komarov Gleck game between two you know, very old school grandmasters. Uh, our next game, however, features two more uh, more modern grandmasters, Jeffrey Zhong against uh, Parham McSudlu. And based on the ratings, I think this game was played like quite a few years ago, but not like a, a super old game at the very least. Now, here White decided not to play the move of e4, but it's not like the old main line, but the modern engines don't really think it's anything special for White. And instead, White plays the move of h4 in this position, which is an idea that we'll see come up in a, in a few different versions. I want to, yeah, give it some special attention in this training to a lot of Dutch players, like, struggle against the h4, h5 plan, as it were, uh, when we play g6, bishop, g7. Uh, but yeah, it's also worth pointing out, like, white does have other approaches, like, if I was playing white, I'd actually be tempted to try move, like, e3 and just play very, very flexibly, in which case, you know, I'd probably think a natural move is to play d5, you know, just avoids any nonsense with, like, you know, if you play knight f6 or d6, you know, bishop c4 is a little bit of an annoying setup, which I think is easiest just to avoid, it's just playing d5. Just avoids that, and, you know, white does still have some advantage, but, you know, you can play, like, c6 and, you know, knight 6, knight f7, and white's going to be a bit better, but it is still a fairly playable position for, for black as such, where we're going to try and play for the e5 break in some cases. And note, by the way, that h5 is not so scary here. We do have h6, and we're able to to keep things stable as such, so we do show one small disadvantage for white of developing a bishop to g5 and, and not f4 as it were. But anyway, h4 was played, and like I mentioned before, the move h6 is probably the most reliable, just going for, for something like this, where again, h5 is going to be met with g5, and you know, I think that with the plan of going for the e5 break quite directly, that white really shouldn't, black shouldn't really have any major problems from what I can see. Uh, you know, for e4, you can play knight c6, and you know, this can lead to... Some rather creative positions where white's probably a tiny bit better, but where it's definitely going to be playable for black. Um, but anyway, the game saw the move c5 by Magsudlu, which objectively speaking probably isn't the best. Like, white can probably just take and 
just go for a very like sort of you know anti-dragon style setup as white but in the game i played a bit more solely with e3 which i mean to be fair white's probably also somewhat better here like i think that as creative as black's attempt was i think that you know white is just going to be much better if he does just play to move queen d2 where you know that guy's going to have problems with you know knight c7 is going to force us to to play some ugly move here and then white could even play moves like dc5 and just like let us take on b2 but saying that I have such a big lead in development that the, the pawn structure doesn't even matter here. Uh, and I would give White, yeah, a very strong initiative. So in the game, though, White Black kind of got away with his experiment. Like after C3, we can even play CD4. And yeah, this this could have caused some problems. But yeah, I think this one was probably just a blitz game and yeah, maybe not of the highest quality. But does show like how creatively you can play the Dutch if you, you know, don't care about the engine evaluations. There's actually a a lot of quite interesting approaches one can take to get a more interesting position. Um, like knight c6 would be, I guess, one one example of such an idea here, uh, where you go for like h4 and you know this fire a different a different version. But anyway, let's see the the final two games where our penultimate game features Narayanan playing as white against Caruana, and you know I can see based on the range this was a relatively old game because Narayanan now is rated nearly two seven hundred feet a. But yeah, this one does actually see the the kind of idea I mentioned before of white playing e3 and now going for the move h4. Um, I mean, I should point out, of course, knight f3 and like natural development is, is always going to be a thing for white. But in that case, you know, you could even play knight h6 as sort of a, a rare but quite creative idea where you can bring the knight to f7 directly as a sort of alternative to the more traditional like c6, bishop d3, you know, knight d7 or knight h6. And yeah, I mean, this is going to be somewhat better for white, but you know, certainly, you know, certainly playable for black as well in a sense where the bishop being on g7 is not, I think, considerably worse than the bishop being on d6 uh, as such. So, but it is true. This is maybe like the worst case scenario of this sort of position where, yeah, white does have a pretty comfortable advantage according to the engine, but it's also kind of what you sign up for when you play the, uh, when you play the Dutch. So white played h4. Black played to move c6 and you know, knight f3, knight d7 just, you know, covers and move knight e5, which, you know, if you play knight h6, this knight e5 is a slightly annoying move here, admittedly. Though it is true we can trade it off, so it's not like the end of the world, it's just a little bit of a sort of dry position if they're able to, to lock things up like this. So Black plays knight d7 to kind of keep things a bit more tense, uh, which it is true, it does give White the chance to play h5 and, you know, this would admittedly set some problems. Because now it's worth pointing out that h6 isn't so effective anymore. Because I have like hg6 and it turns out that white actually has a pretty strong attack for the piece in, in this position. So that is a little bit of a problem with Caruana's move order. You know, if you have to play knight h6, the whole setup is maybe not quite as appealing as before perhaps. But in the game, white was a bit inaccurate with... I mean, maybe it's too strong for inaccuracy, but he played the move bishop d3, which... Well, he played h5 anyway. It turns out you can still do this. And yeah, maybe black should just go knight e4 and you know, try to neutralize it in this way. But of course, it's true. White is still going to be better. Like you can choose whether to go h6 or or hg6 in such a position. Um, you know, probably we would go hg6 so just to make the pawn a little bit weak. But yeah, it's really not so easy for black to play this one after queen b6. Uh, rook b1 maybe it's not the most precise, but it's not a bad move by any means either. And yeah, for around this point, you know, Caruana has defended quite well, just sort of neutralizing the the attack to some extent. And yeah, I mean, from this point, white objectively is quite a bit better. Like if they just play a normal move like bishop h2 and, you know, play knight e2 and make it more like a normal stonewall, then yeah, I think that white does have a fairly nice advantage here. Uh, but in the game, yeah, white started to make some small mistakes, like hg6 already. Starting to give black some very good counterplay down the king's side. And yeah, in the game, Caruana was sort of able to outplay his opponent where already Black is. It's doing pretty well, but, you know, 95 immediately compounds the problems a bit. We're after ED to bishop b5. And d5, um, I think here it's Black, I'd probably just go queen h4 and just go for the h file attack. But Caruana decided to play knight ec5 instead, which, yeah, maybe is a, a step in the wrong direction. And, you know, I guess from this point, I feel like the game maybe lose a little bit of its relevance. Although it is kind of interesting, admittedly, to see that 
in his sole position at even though their bishop looks a lot better than ours that the weakness their king means that black's actually doing fine here but yeah for the rest of the game i mean black was able to kind of you know get what he wanted in the end like bishop d7 bishop g3 and yeah end up like taking a pawn and sort of managing to to hang on to it here where you have to bishop queen h3 probably white should just go bishop f4 and like just put pressure on the pawn because i think in the game this sort of position with the rooks against the queen end up being a lot more stable for black than it actually looked where the queen can get in the d6 but it just doesn't really do a whole lot there as such and yeah black is sort of able to stabilize and kind of just outplay his opponent in a sense uh bishop h4 uh black would just take the pawn on c4 but he decided to go c5 and you know, play a little bit of a tactical trick and yeah the rest was pretty straightforward just d4 and you know the black king is the white king is just getting kind of ripped open here and in this position white uh white did resign as such so yeah i didn't expect i'd show that full game but you know it's always nice to see one of the world's very top players playing our our system as such but yeah i do think that this is probably the worst case scenario that we'll face in this uh you know in this sort of part three of the anti-dutch and like i said if you really want to avoid there is the e6 move order available but let's see one more game in this variation i just want to show what happens if white does insist on playing h4 as quickly as possible as it happened in this game between korobov against bartel uh two quite strong grandmasters in world top 100 and h5 yeah is not really the ideal timing you know again knight c3 and transposing back into the zhong Sula game is is more the way to go here because after h5 black just goes h6 and we can kind of see here that you know white just has a very awkward setup like the bishop doesn't really make sense on d2 and you know by playing for e5 black just already was able to take the initiative and have a very very comfortable position so we can sort of say that korobov's experiment backfired a little bit uh Maybe knight c6 isn't the most precise. You know, I think a move like e4, ed4, queen e7 is probably what I would prefer here. But yeah, knight c6 is not terrible by any means either. You know, black played e4 and actually here white kind of missed a good opportunity to play d5 and, you know, sort of try to get some some play going as such uh, with, you know, the knight coming to d4 and so forth. But after knight fd2, yeah, now black is, is just going to be considerably better where d5 is a bit less effective when the you know the white knight can't jump in at d4 and try to exploit the square in e6 and the double pawns aren't really a problem for black here i mean we do have a very solid position um i think this was probably a rapid or blitz game i do feel like this game maybe loses some of its relevance around this point like i think black should probably just go castles and you know just kind of build up a bit more steadily um yeah we all often have moves like g4 to kind of shut out the defense of h5 allows us to potentially win a pawn so that's going to be where our our chances sort of come from in this case um but yeah those were kind of the main games i i sort of wanted to uh that i want to share for this uh for this training as such uh but there is a final point i do want to kind of mention before we end this series and i think i might have hinted at before in part one but just to sort of let you know that yeah you can play the the stonewall dutch via the the d4 move order with either f5 or e6 and then f5 but admittedly against the english and the other flank openings you'll probably need to play something other than the stonewall dutch because let's say if you play to move f5 in this position why can play knight f3 and g3 and you're going to find yourself in a little bit of a dilemma against this kind of kings and Nina attack slash english hybrid setup or you could call it the neo catalan setup because if you play to move d5, what will happen is that after castles, white actually already has a big advantage in this position. And the reason is that the sort of whole setup with the stonewall is just a lot less effective when they're able to cover the e4 square with pawn. Specifically here, they can play like knight c3, followed by e4, and like already, you know, our stonewall's kind of getting ripped apart. They're threatening e5 to fork our bishop and the knight, so... It means we're kind of forced into some ugly positions like if we play dfe4 for example they just go knight g5 and you know this arising position is an absolute dream for white where you know they've managed to leave us with an isolated pawn on e6 to have a dream outpost for the knight on e4 and this is just unfortunately not really a playable position for black so it means that if you do want to play the stone wall like you can't play it just against c4 
Uh, also, it doesn't really work against Knight F3 either. We can kind of see how, you know, a line like this is basically just transposing to, you know, to what we just saw a moment ago. Uh, or, you know, if G3, similar story that, you know, if we do play like F5, like, at some point, you know, if we play F5, yeah, there's going to be some, uh, there's going to be some problems again. Like, no matter how tricky you get with the move orders, same stuff is still going to follow regardless. So, yeah, that's kind of the problem. And if you do want to play like this stone wall, yeah, you should complement it with a different system against C4 Knight F3, where I think a logical choice would be like to play like the reverse Sicilians. Like, especially if you're an E4 player, it kind of makes sense to play in this way where like Bishop B4 is one flexible setup with not so much fury that can reduce your your workload a bit by not having to learn all the, the main lines. And likewise, if Knight F3, you might still play D5 and it still sort of stay in the kind of spirit of the of the Dutch as such, or let's say E6 and D5. But yeah, you need to play like a little bit of a, a different system, let's say, where, you know, you'd probably be, you know, looking into something like Bishop E7 or, and like, you know, potentially transferring to a normal, like, Kings in Attack French. Or playing a move like c5 which kind of allows you to meet c4 d4 and you know play a little bit more dynamically with a reverse but only type of position um but yeah you do have to be a bit careful with the move orders like you're so you know they can play d4 here and try to move order you into a uh into a different opening as such so that's one reason why yeah you probably would need to learn a another system to deal with that transposition i suppose in theory you could play like some move like b6 and you know just play like the english defense but Again, not sort of a perfect kind of, of setup, as it were. Um, so that's why the Stonewall isn't really kind of a, a standalone system as in that respect. Uh, that you will need to learn a, a different setup. Um, of course, if you play D5, yeah, they can play D4. And yeah, you're going to have to learn like a, a D5 system against this move order. Not ideal, but, you know, there are moves like C5, which can be looked at, you know, to try to reduce your, your theoretical workload a bit, as it were. Uh, I noticed what some players like Glizarov and some other, and Ulibin and some other Stonewall experts like to do as black. Um, but anyway, that's, yeah, what I want to share for these three parts of playing the Stonewall against 1d4, where, yeah, it took a bit of time to cover, like, these games, because we went through, like, 32 model games. But with this level of depth, it means that you really feel very comfortable playing these positions. And I noticed for myself, like, playing this online while recording this series, it was, like, really easy for me to kind of outplay my opponents after going through a lot of these games. So I think that you can also have some good results as well. And yeah, I wish you luck with playing Stonewall in your own games. Uh, do let me know in the comments below what was your central insight or takeaway from this series. And if you are interested in private lessons, I do have a few spots still available to students. So just uh, let me know via either Messenger or email. I've put the, the links to contact me in the description below. Um, and yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.